Ephesians 4, verses 7 to 8. It says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, When he ascended on high, he led captive, captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Giving is the very, in the very nature of God. It is his invention, and it is the custom of his kingdom. If you're in the kingdom, then you should have a giving nature. It really is better to give than to receive. But, you know, it's all right to, be re to receive too, right? Because then you let somebody else give. Simple. It's no surprise that the celebration of Christ's entry into the world, as a, God's entry into the world as a man, should stimulate his people to the exchange of gifts. But gift giving is more and more occurring at this time of the year without any thought of the person who started it all. Today, gift giving has become as much of a burden to many as the old Levitical ordinances were to the Jews up until the destruction of the temp temple in 70 AD. Yeah, some people find it a burden. I hope to show today how the giving of gifts at Christmas is only a representation of an even greater reality that reaches across time from the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness to the cross of Christ and even to you and me. But first, let's look at the record of the coming of Christ's greatest, God's greatest gift, Jesus, the gift of himself, in the person of the Lord Jesus. So let's go to Matthew 2, verses 1 to 11. Matthew 2, verses 1 to 11. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to, to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. Remember that. It went before them until it came and stood, and it stood over where the, the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, as you know, there has long been a tradition based on this record of the birth of Jesus. It's a beautiful tradition of certain wise men from an eastern country coming to lay gifts and worship before the king of kings. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, story, and, and I, I think it's more than a story, but it's been treated as a story for a long, long time. And it's been kind of played around with. Um, there have been different ideas of what it should actually mean. And I was watching David Jeremiah this morning. How many of you watched David Jeremiah? Did anybody see it this morning? Well, he's... Uh, put a, music, a, a movie on called Why, the, Why, the, Why He Was Born. Um, yeah, Why the Nativity, that's right. And, uh, you know, 
The problem is that when you take the data that's been given in the Bible and you make a fiction out of it that seems to, seems to fit everything, at least the spirit of it all. He's done that, yes, he fit the spirit, but he's really messed with it. It's really messed as far as they, for example, the three kings became oriental kings, that is from China, or um, uh, African kings from uh, probably um, Ethiopia, and, uh, and Arab kings probably from Arabia or Babylon. You know, that, that just, that's ridiculous. Not only that, uh, they come to Jesus uh, in Bethlehem two years later, uh, and they're living in a house. Okay. Now, that's not to say that this isn't uh, a popular version of what took place today. You've got people who uh, uh, consider themselves to be the guardians of orthodoxy, who will tell you that uh, the wise men did not come the night of Jesus' birth, uh, that they came up to two years later, and, uh, and, and you know, it sounds good. It sounds like, uh, you know, when you just look at a few of the things, like when Herod said, go king all the babies up to two years of age, and so on. And then, not only that, but uh, the translation, which says that the wise men came to Jesus in the house. Well, I'm going to change all that for you, all right? I've got no problem with, uh, uh, with a tradition that is beautiful and does not affect the truth, all right? You start playing around with it, and then uh, you end up causing all sorts of problems uh, that will not fit with the scriptures. And I'm going to show you some of that yeah, if I rush. In recent years, it's become fashionable within the Christian community to challenge that tradition and declare it to be in error. They say that the wise men did not come to worship the king of the universe at his birth, rather at a much later date, even up to two years afterwards. However, this scholarly assertion may be based on somewhat flimsy assumptions, and they are assumptions. First, it is assumed because Herod ordered the murder of all the children in Bethlehem from infants to two years of age. Well, that's one of their reasons. The fashionable conclusion supporting this assertion is that the wise men would take two years to make such a long journey. However, when we consider that they travel from the east, probably from Babylon, which is most likely because that's where um, the Jews were taken, uh, when they were being dispersed and uh, Daniel was there and Daniel was very well versed with the prophecies so it's very likely that it was Babylon that Babylon they came from but then we're going to ask how far did they have to go and how long would it take well the distance between Babylon and Israel is about 1600 miles and if we can travel at 20 miles a day, which is pretty reasonable, at 20 miles a day, they would cover that, that uh, distance in about three months, not two years. So when Herod told his soldiers to kill the children up to two years of age, it might simply mean that he was being thorough. Next, there is the assumption that Joseph and Mary had moved into a house where they were living in Bethlehem, even though the record tells us that Jesus was brought up in Nazareth, not in Bethlehem. And this assumption presents some problems when considering that the Greek word for the house is oikos. And oikos does not just mean a house. It can also mean a place that they're staying. It can even mean a family. Right? Like the house of David was not the palace. The house of David was the family of David, right? And oikos means a dwelling place, a place we're staying, or a family, as well as a house. So there's one little problem that we have. 
Also, there is a question about the age of Jesus at the time of the visit of the Greek, uh, and, and the Greek word used, the Greek word used for baby in Matthew 20, uh, sorry, Matthew 2, verse 8. Matthew 2, verse 8. These are, these are another two things that I deal with. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, the young child, right? Not a baby, young child. And when you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Well, the word used there is pedion in the Greek. Pedion, which defines as a young child or an infant. Either one. But they've decided, oh no, we're going to choose young child instead of infant, infant because young child means he could be two years old, right? The scholars feel that this strongly supports their theory. But in Luke 2, verses 16 and 17, we got a problem with that. When the shepherds visited the baby, Jesus, the word pedion was used, yes, and the word brephos was also used. The difference is that pedion means a young child, which could be a baby, but brephos means a baby, a newborn, right? It says, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the brephos, the babe, lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child, which can also be a newborn baby. This effectively disqualifies the young child argument. The new theories are not logically sound, and I'm not sure that they would hold up in a court of law. But it's become fashionable to say, oh, we have greater knowledge than you used to have, and now we've seen what, really, what it really means. Well, they don't. And you know, I care nothing for rituals that are without meaning. I'm not interested in traditions that are empty of any connection with God's purposes as revealed in the scriptures. But I do not hold with the defiling or defacing of a beautiful, beautiful tradition that in no way threatens God's purpose, but rather enhances the wonder of the, mo the most miraculous event in the history of the world. And it is particularly disturbing that all this is in the name of orthodoxy and doctrinal purity. In my opinion, the objections of the self-styled guardians of the truth are not based on solid ground, so I would find no reason to tamper with the tradition of the wise men bringing gifts to the infant king and in Bethlehem. People constantly stumble over the non-essentials. The important thing is not the time of the visit, it is rather the purpose of the visit. The wise men were people of note coming to endorse the prophecy of Emmanuel's arrival. They came to present gifts to him, very significant gifts, which we'll go into. And we might ask, why would God, who is never late, send important witnesses to the most important birth in history up to two years after the event? Why would he do that? Well, a close study of the scriptures will reveal that, one, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That's in Luke 2, verses 6 and 7. Second, shepherds visited him the night of his birth, Luke 2, 15. Third, wise men from the east brought him gifts and worshipped him while he was still in Bethlehem. And that's in Matthew 2, 11 and 2, 13. But here's the kicker. Number four, Jesus is taken back to Nazareth after Mary's purification, which was 40 days after his birth. So the wise men had to come within the 40 days. And if they came within the 40 days, why not the very night of his birth? 
Nazareth. From that point, on until his earthly ministry, Jesus lived in Nazareth. He was a Nazarene. We see that in Matthew 2.23, which means one separated unto the Lord for holy purposes. Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit in Nazareth, as a matter of fact. Again, it's to be called to God's surface. And it's in Nazareth, which means separation, that believers are conceived of the Holy Spirit. You know that? Symbolically, when you accepted the Lord, He was conceived in you, and this was Nazareth, because you became a Nazarene. Fortunately, as a Nazarene, you don't have to leave your hair growing long and wear uh, goat skin or anything like that, or, or eat honey and locusts. You know that John the Baptist was a Nazareth, right? Yeah, yeah Nazarene. Um, according to Luke 2, verse 52, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and a man while in Nazareth. And so do we. As we remain separated, we also grow. Now, when the wise men arrived, they brought gifts to Jesus. And they worshipped him. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And why do you suppose they brought these specific gifts? I believe the answer lies in the scriptures, what the scriptures show us that these substances represent. All three played a major part in the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness and in the temple built by Solomon. All three, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, continued to be important in the ceremonial life of Israel. And all three symbolized Jesus as the firstborn among many brethren. In Exodus 30 verse 3, we find that pure gold was used to cover the incense murder burner that stood before the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. Also, the menorah, representing union of Christ and the believer, is made of pure gold. That's in Exodus 25, verse 31, where it says, You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered, uh, hammered work, its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs, and flowers shall be of one piece. The menorah had six arms three on each side of one upright. Okay? So what you have here is the number six connect connected to the number one, which gives you a seven. Seven is a number of completion. Therefore, there's no, there's, there's no accident here. The upright, the number one, is Jesus, and the six is man connected to him. If man is not connected to God, He's not complete. And it's interesting that the menorah was a source of light in the tabernacle in the wilderness. Without the menorah, there was no light in the holy place. In Exodus 30, verse 23, we find that myrrh was the chief ingredient in the holy anointing oil. Anointing oil is for Exousia, it's for authority. Some say power. And in Exodus 30, verses 34 to 36, <clears throat> we find that frankincense was used in the holy incense that was burned before the ark where God met with man. And what, what was the incense burned for? It was for a sweet savor to ascend to God, right? It's been called the prayers of the saints, for example. And in, in Exodus 30, verses 34 to 36, we find that frankincense was used in the holy incense. I already said that. Uh, gold, that's the next one, is incorruptible. It's a 
covering over the shittim wood of the incense burner. It pictures deity housed in the, in the carnal body of the Savior. Because remember, Jesus is fully man and fully God at the same time. We have a similar situation with us, you know. And I can, if you remember, several weeks ago, I preached on a diverse covering, diversity of coverings, and I showed how, uh, going back all the way to Joseph, when he was given his coat, <laughs> not of many colors, that's, not, that's false. That coat was a full covering, a full covering down to the wrists and to the ankles, full covering. And I showed where, when you look at the Hebrew, you find out the Hebrew language spells it out for you that it was a covering that did not, that kept you from uh, condemnation. It was a code of purity, a code of protection. And then you come up to uh, Christ as his crucifixion, and uh, the soldiers were casting lots for his seamless garment, right? And when you look at the seamless garment in the Greek, you find out that it actually means without puncturing, without puncturing. <laughs> Jesus is punctured in his hands, and his feet, and his head. Right? Because puncturing was part of the crucifixion process. So anyway, when you put it all together, without puncturing, when you follow the roots, you find out it means without condemnation. So that that covering, that seamless garment, is what every born-again believer wears. That we are without condemnation. Because we have the complete covering, even as Joseph had with his complete covering. Which came from his father, incidentally, right? I'm trying to go too fast here. <clears throat> so gold is incorruptible. You know, gold is absolutely incorruptible. It will not rust. It doesn't combine with the, with the air. You don't have gold oxid oxidization. Um, <clears throat> so gold is representative of purity and that which will withstand the effects of time, right? <clears throat> it pictures deity housed in the carnal body of the Savior. And it is a covering of righteousness that God places on all those he sets aside as his adopted ones. And as I said, if you are born again, you have that covering on you. And now Romans 8.1 is in effect. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk, and remember this, you walk according to the will of God in righteousness, not according to the flesh. Myrrh is the holy anointing oil used for consecration in the furniture and the priests of the tabernacle. It is the authority of the Savior to manifest God's will in the world. And it is the anointing oil of the saints the believers, to God's service. We are anointed to God's service. This is what the myrrh actually represents, the anointing, the authority that's given to those who are born again. Incense is for the holy incense burned before the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle. It is talking about the submission of the Savior's will to the authority of the Father. And it is the offering of the life of the saint in prayer and in spiritual fruit. In short, it's worship in spirit and in truth. 
the gifts of the wise men are still offered to the Lord by his people. This is Romans 12, 1, right? That we offer ourselves a living sacrifice, which really is a reasonable act of worship. During this Christmas season, let us reflect on how the wise men did not bring gifts to each other. They didn't bring gifts for Mary and Joseph. They brought their gifts to Jesus. Jesus, who offered himself as the greatest gift of all. And he has never stopped offering himself. He is still the greatest gift of all. How many people have joyfully opened their gifts given by the hand of man but never received the gift of Jesus given by the hand of God? Lots, lots, and lots. Jesus is the gift of eternal life and joy unspeakable. In him, all the hopes and dreams of man are fulfilled. So I've tried to show how the gift giving of the, this season is a reflection of a greater reality, how the greatest of all gifts came not from the hand of man, but from God. And here I'll tie it all together. God gives us a covering of gold, a holy covering, a setting apart his righteousness unto sanctification. He gives us myrrh, an anointing leading to the infilling of his Holy Spirit and the death of the self and the authority of the believer. And he gives us frankincense, which speaks of all things that pertain to life and godliness. As it says in Second Peter 1, 3, so that we may be a sweet savor to him as our spiritual fruit rises to him from the spiritual, from the sense of, because you know what? He's given us everything we need. Go down to the next verse, Camille. Yeah. Verse 4. He's given us everything that we need. Everything. Made all sorts of promises. And he keeps his promises. And why does he do all this? He's given us authority to manifest his will. We are his hands and feet in the world. Why? Because we have become partakers of the divine nature. That is awesome. That is, that is so awesome. If you really think about it, just don't just gloss over it, you know, read over it quickly, that we become partakers of his divine nature. That is so awesome. And I know I've mentioned it before. I will never stop mentioning it. Because, because of Jesus, we can become partakers of the divine nature. Without Jesus, this could never have happened. In the Old Testament, he said, I'll share my glory with nobody. Jesus came and said, come, I'll share my glory with all who come. And what's glory? Kabod? It's value. Those people who think that I am nothing, I don't look as good as other people, I'm not as strong as other people, I don't have a job like other people. You know what? You can say, Jesus is in me and I have been given value beyond my comprehension. You don't have to be special because you become special. Because of him. Because of him. I pray that during this season, we will be reminded that what is important is not how many gifts we receive from family and friends, that, as delightful as that is. What is most important is the gifts of worship 
and obedience that we lay before our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. You know, I've been asked more than once, why is it that I am so careful to walk according to his righteousness? And my answer has always been the same, is because I will never want to dishonor my Lord. That's the most important thing to me, that I will not dishonor my Lord. So let this season be a bowing before the mastery, the majesty, the majesty of God and offering him our worship, our worship in spirit and in truth. And I'll finish with Romans 11.36. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Jesus is the all in all. He is everything. Without him, we would have no hope. Without him, we would have no future. Without him, we'd be stumbling around in the dark. But with him, we can make it through any storm any storm. There's no storm that will overcome those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. No matter how bad it looks, 